when I found out about this opportunity to return, I was so, so happy and so excited to be coming, to have the opportunity to come back because I uh, just really enjoyed my time here. Uh, it was one of the times when I would regularly walk home from work and just be so happy and excited about what had happened that day. And I'm rediscovering that same thing again. So even though I'm the head of, I, I would say that, you know, Enter Segment Cornea is like my first wife and UVA is like my second wife. And I know we're not supposed to uh, prefer one over the other. <laughs> Whenever I was here before, Al, Al Vitali and I founded the uveitis division, and uh, we said we both agreed that we needed the other, our other specialty, in addition to uveitis, or we get too depressed. And if you, if your retina person says that, you know that the uveitis is bad here. So, um, you know, the epidemiology of uveitis has been something I've been working on. Uh, it's been a theme in my research, and so I just wanted to kind of talk about that and and really how much things have changed uh, over the course of years as far as our understanding about epidemiology. Epidemiology is certainly responsible for a large, a large uh, uh, amount of the vision loss in the world, uh, responsible up to 10% in some surveys. And it's said that somewhere between 3,000 and 30,000 new episodes of blindness happen each year from uveitis. Um, that 3,200 3, is uh, my own estimate based on some work we did. The 30,000 is from uh, Bob Nusenblatt. And about one in 1,000 people is affected each year in the United States from uveitis, and probably outside the United States, it's much higher than that. So prior to me kind of getting interested in this, there was actually very little information about the epidemiology of uveitis. There's one study that was done in Minnesota in the 1950s in Olmsted County, Minnesota. That area of Minnesota was a very uh, Scandinavian area, all white. Didn't look much like the rest of the world or the United States today. Incidents and, relative, and rates of disease were fairly low. But that, those numbers actually reflected information we had from other white populations in the world in, in Finland, Switzerland, Great Britain. Um, and like I said, those, those populations are probably not too much different than the population back in Minnesota in the 1950s. We actually had very limited uh, information on people of color until fairly recently, but there is some evidence that people of color may have higher rates of uveitis. In one study in, uh, in South Africa, they found that possibly an incidence rate of 27.2. I worry about the access to care at that hospital where they did this, uh, where they did this um, estimation. In one Indian survey, they found the point prevalence, meaning that the number of people affected by uveitis at one point in time is probably up to 714 per 100,000, astronomically high levels. So um, when I was working, my first job after I left uh, KCASH was to go back and work at Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the largest medical groups in the world outside of the US v Veterans Administration system. Um, I, I took that job because I saw the opportunity to do epidemi epidemiologic research there. And Kaiser was responsible for about a third of the population at that time. It was a very diverse population, uh, including you know, across ethnic, uh, socioeconomic differences across the uh, population. Um, and so we looked at about a third of the, that population, we looked at a, a series of uh, communities in Kaiser, which was actually fairly easy to do because of the way the whole system is set up. And in looking at these, this group of patients, almost 730,000 people, we, seven, I'm sorry, 740,000 people, we found 844 cases of active uveitis, 382 new patients, 462 prior onset. So, a term used for a new onset patient is incidence. Usually we talk about prevalence, which means all the patients affected. So that's why I talk about incident patients versus prior onset patients. We found out that the incidence in this population was about 50, 52 uh, per 100,000, which was about 2.67 times higher than this previous um, study done in Minnesota. Now, this, this chart right here really shows what our, our usual anecdotal experience is in the clinic. Okay? So it's the number of patients 
per in the different age groups. So if I ask you, you know, like, where is uveitis most common? You'd say, well, you know, the kind of 45 to 64 year old age group, because that's what you see the most in the clinic. But that doesn't really take into account the denominator population. Where do these people come from? And that's really where, you know, we kind of step from the anecdotal experience to the more epidemiologic view of things. And when you look at the, um, the population you're coming from, what we see is the rates of disease are very different. The, pa the pattern is very different. So there's still a lot of people, a high rate in this group, but actually a much higher rate in the over 65 group. And the reason is because there's not that many of these people around, okay? So what we saw was this crescendo of disease over the course of time as people got older. This was a huge shift in, in uh, how people thought about uveitis. And, and I had people get very angry at me at uh, some meetings because they didn't believe this data. And I just said, you know, I, I, don't, I, I can just tell you what the information is. I, I, I stand by this information. Um, and at the time, we also, this study, you know, had a much higher rate of disease than other, these other studies, most of which were in, tend to be in white populations. Now, since then, there has been a study in uh, Hawaii and at Kaiser there. They basically use the same methodology. There's also been a study in the VA system in the United States. Like th those populations are a little bit different. Um, the, pop the study we did here in Northern California remains to be the largest epidemiologic study of uveitis ever done. So when we look at the age issues though, again, so if we look at the Hawaii data, you do see this kind of crescendo over time. This is the Northern California data. And then this study over here was actually a study, I had to use a completely different graph because they looked at the rates of uveitis in people over 65 using Medicare data. And you can see this is astronomically higher than any of these. That's why I had to put on a different chart or else it would have been completely blow, would be way up here and it'd be off the, off the slide. So, you know, as people started to see more data, they said, okay, well, maybe Greitz isn't crazy after all. So we look at, um, age and gender, this is looking at the incidence rate, the new onset rate. So in our study, we saw this issue where older women, it wasn't, didn't approach the P of 0.05, but it actually did just maybe suggest there might be something going on there. And this, in, in the, the white data, it also shows that definitely an effect of age, maybe not so much on gender. And when we look at prevalence, that's all the people affected. All the people affected, both prior onset and new onset. We saw much higher rates again, not surprisingly. Um, there's different ways to look at prevalence. So one is pure point prevalence, which is what I mentioned, meaning like how many people are affected by this disease at this moment in time, or at this time when we go to their house and do a survey. There's also period prevalence, which is usually what people talk about, and that's the number of people affected over a period of time. And typically, 12 months of a period would be an annual prevalence, and that's what often people talk about, but it, people aren't always so uh, strict in their definitions. So this is looking at the one-year period prevalence, which that, there weren't many studies that actually looked at that. Um, again, we're higher than those. Now, if we look at prevalence of age and gender stratification, now at this point, you see that there's a very statistically significant effect of gender with men, women being more affected than men, still the effect of age. Now what does that mean? Well, if you look at incidence versus prevalence, we're talking about who's affected once versus who tends to have ongoing disease, okay? And so what this may be indicating is that women may be a little higher, older women especially, maybe a little higher risk for getting uveitis once, but they appear to be much more likely to have ongoing disease. And that's really important because that's really where you have loss of vision and complications. 
It's not that one episode of iritis that causes serious problems, it's the ongoing relentless inflammatory activity that damages the eye. So what's the role of ethnicity? Well, so we took part of the, um, part of our cohort and looked at three different communities where there was a nice kind of distribution of different people, um, mostly Caucasian, but also a significant portion Asian, African, Hispanic. And what we saw there with incidents, again, was that people of African descent tend to have maybe a little higher rates of disease compared to everyone else. However, again, when we looked at the prevalence, we saw a very strong association and a higher risk for people who are of, Af of African descent. And so again, it's that same kind of pattern with the older women where maybe someone who has African descent is a little higher chance for getting that first inflammatory episode, but at a greater risk for developing ongoing uveitis. Now, some people might say, well, that's just related to sarcoidosis, that's all. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But just to talk about the uh, comparing this to Hawaii, which I think is probably the other, that's the, really the other largest epidemiologic study looking at uveitis. Um, they did, see, they did see higher rates in people of African descent versus other, that's the red bars. Um, but they actually had a very, very tiny, tiny population of people of African descent in Hawaii, in Kaiser. Um, they had more, many more people of a Pacific Islander descent, which makes sense. And those people seem to have a lower rate of uveitis compared to others. So again, even in the Hawaii group, even though it was a very tiny population of people of African descent, there might be something going on there. So, sarcoid. Obviously, if we look at just the patients with systemic sarcoidosis, so that's the people where our internal medicine colleagues would have no problem saying this patient has sarcoidosis, it had a biopsy or something else. The uh, rates of disease were much higher, almost 12 times higher for people of African versus non-African descent. Now, the, okay. and then if we add what, what I call ocular sarcoidosis, meaning that patients have ocular disease that clinically is consistent with sarcoidosis, in addition to some lab tests or other supportive evidence, but they don't have a biopsy, okay? So there's, you know, and so I think it looks like ocular sarcoidosis, but we're not gonna go biopsy the eye in this case. That is much higher rate risk of having sarcoidosis, okay? Almost 18 times higher risk. But it's not just sarcoidosis, okay? So in the patients with Complete workup of uveitis, meaning they had the full court ivory tower workup. And because this was a retrospective study in a population of, you know, general population of ophthalmologists and so forth doing, doing work, not everyone got that ivory tower workup. We saw about almost 1.7 times higher risk in people African versus non African. And then there were a lot of patients where they came in, they didn't have the full workup. And first I was worried, well, is there something discrimination-wise? Is, is, are people of African descent getting, uh, getting a work, full workup less more commonly? There wasn't any statistical significance there, maybe a little bit higher difference. But again, the odds ratio was 2.5 times higher for idiopathic inflammation too. So it's not just sarcoidosis. Something else may be going on, seems to be going on. And there is other evidence elsewhere where the prevalence in people in Amber, under Pradesh, India, 832 t 32 people per 100,000, astronomically high. Tamil Nadu, South Southern India, almost 300, 10, 000, 10 per 100,000. So much higher rates in people in India generally. So shifting a little bit, you know, complications. Um, it, we all know that patients with UVIs have complications. When I, when I first started showing some of my work uh, research to some of the chiefs at Kaiser, they were very upset because they thought that this, the, the complications and so forth were somehow reflecting poorly on the care at Kaiser. And I said, no, that's actually not the case at all. I was, I was very happy to see the care patients were getting, but it's just that it's a bad disease. So 
One complication is shown in the, uh, in the gray bars, multiple complications shown in the, in the lighter gray bar. Higher rates, but trend, nothing, you know, not to that 0.05 level in prior onset patients. And so we looked at kind of what are the risk factors for complications overall. We found that older age people, uh, this is per year, well, I'll just point out year, were more likely to get uh, complications. Um, gender, um, again, looks like uh, men were at a higher risk for complications compared to women. For the course of uveitis, um, it appears that chronic patients are more likely to get uveitis too. That's not surprising, but it is, it's nice to understand that better too. And that those patients like HLAB27, recurrent disease, actually weren't at a, although it appears that they have a little bit higher rates of complications, it's not at least statistically significant. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about this unclear group. Because that's an important group. So this, are, because this was a retrospective study in busy eye, eye clinics, not every patient got a dilated fundus exam. So I couldn't say exactly, uh, or, or I'm sorry, in this case it was like a little bit unclear exactly what the course was because of their follow-up. But I'll start about anatomically, we have this same kind of indeterminate group because not everyone got a, got a dilated fundus exam. Now sometimes that would be, or it's because patient comes in, doctor looks, sees iritis, hands the patient a bottle of Pred Forte, the patient gets better, and they don't get dilated. Not good care, I, I certainly believe. Um, but probably the patient did have anterior, but I couldn't really say that for sure. But uh, you know, I, I want to just emphasize also the importance, as all of you know, but just to re-encourage you, that it is always important to do the dilated exam in every patient you see that has uveitis. Um, because I've certainly been referred patients in the past other places where the patient, I was told the patient had ongoing iritis that couldn't be controlled, and I looked in the back and I saw something like toxoplasmosis lesion or snowballs and intermediate uveitis. So here's the one for anatomic location. Um, anterior, intermediate, and posterior panuveitis. Um, more risk for, I'm sorry, less risk if you have anterior uveitis versus anything else. So we couldn't really break it down according to which diagnoses were more likely to get complications just because of the, when you chop things up and there's too many small groups. We did see though the people with idiopathic uveitis were less likely to experience complications compared to the other, other, all the other groups. And, and that's actually a helpful thing for me because at least often patients will get uh, frustrated because they said, oh, you did all this work, work up and nothing showed up. You don't know why this is being caused and you don't know what's causing this inflammation problem. And, and I say, well, that's true, but, but actually one good thing is that because we couldn't find a cause, you're actually less likely to have complications over time. So that's actually a good thing. And I said, you know, and we did all the, all the latest technology tests that were indicated for you. And you know, you're in a group of about 50% of patients where there, everything is normal. Uh, now I'm using that 50% as far as things that, you know, the normal numbers in the United States. It's a little bit different here, obviously. We'll talk about that also. This is actually one really important slide, and I want to talk about this. Um, so when we looked at glaucoma, you know, about 11% of people had, had problems with glaucoma or pressures that required glaucoma medications or other interventions. When we looked at the chart, 80 almost 86% of the doctors blamed steroids. Said it was all about the steroid. And, and you hear the same thing from patients. Oh, the steroids caused my glaucoma. The other, other comments in the chart said uveitis about 5.4%, combined mechanism 2.2%, no comment about where, what's causing the pressure problem, 6.5%. Now, when we, went, when we did the study, we actually went back to the chart and we looked, at the, looked through the chart and said, okay, what was the pressure? What was the inflammation? What was the steroid doing at, at each of the visits? How was all this really laid? What was really at the base, the base root cause of the pressure problems? And when we looked at it in that very systematic way, we found a very different story. We found that um, uveitic glaucoma, I'm sorry, we found that the most common thing was combined mechanism. Probably some issue with steroids and, and 
I'm sorry, aerosteroids and UVIs, but we couldn't really sort it out. The percentage of patients that had pure steroid response actually was very low, was the lowest group, okay? And uveitis was actually 36, 36% almost. So it was a very different story than what doctors' usual um, comments were, and also patients. And I think this really reflects a lot of things where people don't want to blame the medicines, they want to, I'm sorry, the people don't want to blame the disease or realize, oh, this is a bad disease and this disease caused this. They'd much rather blame those medications the doctor gave me or this other thing that happened that was outside, the doctor, surgery the doctor did or whatever else. You know, they don't res respect that, oh, this disease is bad and this is what the disease does. I think it's especially important as physicians that we take this into account because although I, I certainly agree steroid response is important and you should respect it, if we don't treat inflammation, the patient's eyes are gonna suffer, our patient's gonna suffer. So we can't back off and undertreat patients because we're scared about steroid response. Um, other associated variables, so for uveitic glaucoma, m chronic patients were much more commonly affected, 25 times more likely to be affected. Um, combined mechanism, age was affected with older patients, males, and again, chronic, chronic uh, course. Steroid response, we couldn't see any uh, specific risk factors. Um, certainly, you know, we usually think of children being more likely to be affected by steroid response. That's my own clinical impression, but we couldn't support that by our data of this very large, uh, large um, cohort of patients. Other patients, um, you know, four percent, four percent had like transient increases that basically went away with inflammatory treatment. Iris Bombay are an interesting group, and that's something we see here at, at uh, Kekesh. Uh, location with panuveitis being most common and uh, anter, anter being less common. So this is a very small group, but I think that also goes with my experience here that seeing Bombay, for instance, in our VKH patients um, and other patients that have ongoing panuveitic entities um, being more likely to get virus Bombay. Um, vision loss, you know, affects a lot of our patients. Uh, okay, and so trying to sort this out from a this, this slide just kind of points out how complex it is to try to uh, characterize vision loss or vision from a retrospective study. But, but, and also points out that patients have vision loss, sometimes short term, sometimes long term. Vision loss associations, again, older patients, males, um, chronic patients more likely, and everywhere besides the anterior was more likely to lose vision dramatically higher risk for non-anterior locations to cause vision loss. So with, as far as this kind of body of work goes, you know, what we saw were the incidence and prevalence was higher than previous U.S. studies. We saw this effect of age and gender, um, as well as the effect of uh, race and ethnicity in the uh, risk of disease. Um, we also saw that a lot of patients have complications Older patients more likely and chronic patients more likely have complications, but anterior and uh, idiopathic patients less likely to have complications. Again, with the uh, secondary glaucoma, affects a lot of people. Steroid response is much less common than doctors and patients want to blame. And vision loss is, al vision loss is also associated with gender, chronic disease, and older age. So I'll shift a little bit more. Now, I, I was asked to give this uh, talk on very short notice because Dr. Tabara certainly had to back out of his uh, previous obligation. But that, that's fine. I, I'm not, I didn't mean to say about, anything bad about Dr. Tabara. But I, I wish I would have had a little more time to get ready because we have some, some other studies that are, are pending and we're working on the analysis. I'll mention them briefly, but there's some other data coming that I, I'm very excited to see and I wish I had today. So one study we're looking at is also at um, the epidemiology of uh, uveitis in the Bronx. These are uh, people that are working with them on this. Uh, Stephen Walters is one of my residents. Eric is here. Eric is one, my research fellow who came, to me with, came with me to Saudi Arabia for a short time. Jonathan Pell is my previous research fellow. And Jane was uh, another med I'm sorry, medical student who's working with me. So in the Bronx is the northern part of New York City, 
uh, about 1.4 million people. Uh, it's a very poor area of, poor area of, uh, poor area of actually the, the United States, one of the poorest congressional districts. Uh, it's a very racially diverse, uh, very heavily Latino group. The number of, and so, and the, and the Latinos are actually a very diverse group there. So the Latinos are an entire rainbow of uh, appearance in the Bronx. And actually the, the people in the Bronx, only 11% are kind of white, non-Hispanic. Montefiore, where I was working at that time, uh, takes care of about a third of the population of the Bronx. And, and the primary uh, mission of Montefiore is to take care of the people of the Bronx. It was also a referral center, but really the Bronx people are who we took care of. So they have a, a system there called the clinical looking glass, which I think would be a, a great thing if it could be developed here, which really brought together all the different, a number of different uh, computer systems at the hospital. And we could use it for personal medical practice just to check to see how your patients are doing in a number of different aspects. Uh, could use for QA as well as research. Uh, brought together really the electronic medical record, laboratory exams, radiology, drug prescriptions, ICD-9 coding, CPT coding, the, this now ICD-10, um, the type of insurance patient has, as well as the U.S. National Death Registry and U.S. Census data. So it's quite a powerful tool. It wasn't the end all, but it could really help you to account, gather a lot of information easily. So the the... The part of this study I'm talking about today is actually a very tiny glimpse of it because it only looks at basically uh, about a, a little bit over a year of data just looking at the incident patients. And we compared these to a control group who were also from the Bronx who had just sought care at the Mont in the Montefiore system. And what we saw was patients with uh, new onset uveitis, older patients were at higher risk for getting uveitis. Uh, patients with diabetes are actually at lower risk for getting uveitis, and people with asthma were at a higher risk as well. Um, there were no associations for socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender, HIV status, smoking, or atopic dermatitis. So this just basically states those things. You know, I'm, I'm looking very forward. That, so this is actually one of the... Uh, presentations we're going to have at Arvo, um, where we'll be looking not just at the, those incident new onset patients, but all the patients that were collected over the course of a 30-month time period, which is an expansion of, this, of these numbers as well. I just want to talk about the KCASH epidemiology of uveitis uh, survey that Hassan, as well as many other people here, have been involved with. 888 cases over the course of a 10-year period. And you know the the uh, the di diagnoses that we're looking at from that study are very familiar to all of us, and and it's not surprising, but it's really nice to see numbers and understand better. Um, VKH and Vetch, it's very common. Um, presumed DTB, shockingly common. Um, and on the other hand, things like and as well as Fuchs, I was actually thought Fuchs would be higher from my own experience from the past, but uh, you know, as well as not that much toxo, but I think when you think about the numbers, it actually is a, signif a significant number of cases in the end. Um, one thing as I was kind of preparing this and I've been thinking about also, is how could we come up with a comparative group, a comparison group, a control group, to compare to our uveitis cohort? And this is kind of a one possible point of discussion after, the, after we get done talking, because you know, to describe a cohort of patients is one thing. That can be very helpful. But if you can have somebody to compare it to, then you can look at things like the risk factors. What's the strength of association for all these different things? And that's really where you can start to understand things much more powerfully if you can have something to compare the patients with disease to. So I, I don't know if it would be, you know, and, and at, if we're just dealing with patients at the eye hospital, that also makes it complicated. Um, if we're going to get a cohort from this, the, eye, the eye hospital, um, if we're going to get from another hospital maybe that we think would maybe better represent a general population that has other health problems. It's a very complex question, but I think if we could figure it out, it really could help us to, to up our game in, in epidemiology here at the hospital 
Yeah, I think it'd be great to do. Lots of fun, very exciting too. You know, and I just wanted to kind of mention, so this, this compares to, that chart compares to like the Bronx where most patients are unknown, lots of sarcoidosis, uh, lots of zoster and, and herpes, and JIA. And, and this just is a nice graph that um, reflects these different diagnoses around the world. Africa in 2007, China in 2005, India, Japan, Saudi Arabia. And saying, you know, that toxo, obviously some places much higher than others. Herpes, same thing. You know, that depending on where you are, it affects the disease you see. So I think that's a very interesting thing. And, and but also I always kind of think about what can we learn from this place that can help not just people in Saudi Arabia, but it please people out other, other places in the world also. And also when I work in the Bronx, I think about how can this help people elsewhere as well? So, um, just want to talk about one other area that I've been working in in the past years, and that's in, in Cuba. So this is another area where I, I there's actually some, uh, so I'm going to talk about one, again, one aspect of that work. There's actually a, uh, another body of data that we're working on looking at uveitis overall. But the first thing we actually published is on toxoplasmosis. Now, in Cuba, half of the cases, over half of the cases of uveitis were related to toxo. Huge numbers, huge numbers. So this work was done with George Jorge Bastillo, who uh, was a... Was a UVI specialist in a central province in Cuba. So Cuba is a very interesting place to work and has really unique aspects that make it very special and promising for understanding disease and then potentially making interventions. Um, it's this very well enumerated population. There's a well organized medical care system. I mean, you hear a lot about the medical care system. I can talk about that as well. I, my, I'd say my opinion of the medical system evolved over the course of my eight visits there. Um, but I think there, there, there are some very good things about the system. It's probably not what the, the Cuban government tells us it is, but, um, but it actually has some good aspects to it as well. It's a very, it's a pyramidal organization. So vertically oriented. So every patient has their PCP, their primary care doctor. Every primary care doctor, there's a primary care doctor slash nurse team who's associate, who's responsible for a small, for a relatively small number of patients. And they have to see everyone in their catchment every year. Um, they're, actually, they're actually held responsible for the, the people's health that they have on their list. This is actually in one of the uh, little village outside of Havana. This is actually the doctor's house. The clinic is downstairs, and he and his family live upstairs. And it's a very, you know, this is like a very, very small place. He has like, uh, doctors typically are responsible for somewhere six to 800,000 people. And so that's, that's who they take care of. And they're, that's their primary job, is to make sure those people stay as healthy as possible, along with their nurse. And then if they have something that's, um, a problem that's more complex than they can take care of, they refer the patient to a polyclinic where there's usually some specialty care. There's, there are ophthalmo ophthalmologists often at these polyclinics. And then if, that, if, if it's more complex than these people can take care of, they send it to the regional referral center. And this is where we were working in Sancta Spiritus. And then if it's too complex for them, they send it to Havana to this tertiary referral center. And there's basically one place in Havana for each each area of medicine in general. So this is the map of Cuba here. Havana is over here. Sancta Spiritus province is here, and this is the city of Sancta Spiritus within the province. Um, there's actually 20 municipalities, and so th th this does, uh, the center here did get a catchment, receive it from the other uh, areas as well. Um, and we, we really looked at the first year of Dr. Bastillo being there because that was a period of time where everybody was referring him everything that they'd been saving up for so long and referring him a lot of cases that maybe weren't referred later as he kind of worked to educate doctors and help doctors take better care of patients near home. And he estimated that probably at that time he was receiving about 90% 
at least 90% of the UVI's cases within the province of Sancta Spiritus. Okay. So we wanted to look at what, what is the kind of situation with the toxoplasmosis there, and then looking at determining the rates of disease and risk factors from a population-based standpoint. So we looked at this one-year period when he first arrived for the, the toxoplasmosis patients. He looked really at clinical, uh, clinically, uh, clinically, a clinical diagnosis of toxoplasmosis and response to therapies as you would expect. If there's serology or, la or laboratory testing available as well, we use that. That was not so common there because of just the availability of these tests. Um, most patients, so this 196 patients had active disease in the descriptive cohort, which included all the patients he saw. Um, quiescent scarring, not so interesting because these patients just kind of happened in. There's probably a lot more patients out there with chronic uh, quiescent scarring that don't, didn't make it in. We did see that patients in this descriptive group who are HIV positive were much more likely to present with retina multifocal lesions and also, we saw that they are more likely to develop uh, vision loss. A lot of the patients did come in with, uh, with vision loss. Um, like I said, HIV positive were more likely to have vision loss. Um, if they had lesions in the zone one, much more likely to have vision loss. Congenital patients were more likely to have central lesions, which is something people kind of believe, but we also uh, I guess saw there also, and uh, patients in the back, patients with lesions in the back were also likely more likely to have vision loss as well. Strabismus was more likely to happen in patients with congenital uh, toxoplasmosis. HIV positive patients also tended to have more neurotoxoplasmosis and optic nerve atrophy following a, an episode or during an, and following an episode. In the recurrences, uh, a significant percentage of patients did have recurrences. Um, most of the recurrent patients were kind of in a young adult range. Um, in Dr. Bastillo's group, patients treated with trimethoprim sulfa or I'm sorry, sulfa alone were less likely to develop recurrences. Now, that could be because he treated those patients who had less severe disease with this medicine, but actually there was at least one study that showed that maybe this, there is something there. Uh, and that's really, you know, like that, what can we treat pitch toxoplasmosis patients to decrease recurrences is certainly, I think, a very important question. So then getting to the more of the population-based uh, uh, aspect of this, and this is where we isolated just the patients from Sanctus Spiritus. We had good population data, data from this same period. 158 patients qualified for this, and again, this is the number of patients. So, most most females, much many more females in this kind of mid group, were coming into the clinic. And then when we looked at it for the different municipalities, we saw that. You know, again, females tended to have higher levels, um, and this group was still had the highest rates of disease. Now we're actually able to break it down into the different municipalities within the province, and we saw that these two provinces had much higher rates of toxoplasmosis than some of the other places. Um, we don't know why. Uh, it may be related to farming practices. It's something that I think is a very interesting question because certainly we'd like to have, if we can find ways to decrease the rates of toxoplasmosis both in Cuba as well as around the world and in uh, tropical places, it could actually have amazing health benefits to patients, not just from an ICO standpoint, but many other standpoints. So very high rates of disease, relatively. Um, the oldest groups were less likely to be affected. Um, highest group rates in the patients from 25 to 44, and then men, women were much more likely to, were more likely to be affected than men. This is actually the first Index Medicus listed um, original research from Cuba in the past 25 years, ophthalmology or non-ophthalmology. 
Um, and it was also the first time that rates of active ocular toxoplasmosis have ever been reported in the literature. So there, there's, a, there's also an entire database we're working on right now that's going to look at all the other uveitis in, in the province, and uh, hopefully that's going to be completed in the next month or so. So just to kind of recap all these things, you know, looks like patient populations at risk include older patients, particularly older women. Um, maybe there are, there's a heterogeneity of um, the UBS risk for different age, racial groups. Um, you know, maybe that people of African descent have higher rates of disease. Um, certainly, this is an area that I think find it is very interesting. And I'm especially curious about like kind of the genetics of all this. You know, we often, the gold standard for what a race person is, you ask them, what race are you? And that actually doesn't, isn't, doesn't necessarily match the genetics. So I think that's a whole other area, that, especially here, I'm very curious about like our, the issues with VKH and with Betches. Uh, there must be something going on with the, silk, the historic silk route distribution of the disease, but, but what is it? Why is it that people in this area are so much more likely affected by the diseases? And can we find something in the genetics that actually helps to explain it um, in some way? And potentially if we can explain it that way, maybe there can be some sort of other intervention that could happen. Um, good. So UBIS is a bad disease. You guys know that. But um, I think you know, hopefully by better understanding who's affected, and better understanding the disease overall, we can actually decide on how we can help patients more. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of talk takeaway points that are more about kind of uh, editorializing, but um, important, you know, always make sure we dilate our patients. Don't just assume that things are normal in the back because I've been proven wrong about whether things are normal in the back many times. Um, prophylact, I would strongly recommend against prophylactic iridotomies if a patient has 306 degrees is sneaky, but no Bombay. I would recommend against making a PI because I've certainly seen a number of patients where they, the doctor thinks, oh, they're pro a prophylactic PI and save the patient problems, but it actually creates a whole cycle of problems because what happens is, if the, even though you see 306 degrees of sneaky, if there's no Bombay, there's actually little tiny channels where the aqueous is percolating through and we do a PI, those channels are gonna collapse and scar down. And the PI can actually spark inflammation and the PI can close down. It can just lead to this whole cycle of lots of problems over time. Um, make sure that all inflammation is treated aggressively, except for the patients with Fuchs uveitis. Those are patients where you can watch, where we can tolerate some mild ongoing uh, uh, inflammation. Also watching patients closely post-operatively. So there's a, is often, there can be a crescendo of inflammation over the first five days after surgery. And this is something I saw here where, and I've seen ever since, is that a patient on first post-op day one may have a beautifully quiet, pristine eye, and post-op day two they have fibrin. And I ramp up the, the treatment, and the next day they have more fibrin. And this can actually happen over the course of five days. And what I saw in the Kaiser study was actually, you know, that people would get away with and be lucky and see the patients on the post-op day one, post-op day one week and not have problems. But I also saw patients in the uveitis, uveitis cohort where the patients would be seen post-op day one, they'd be doing fine. Post-op week one, they'd have a, an antechamber sock full of fibrin. And then those patients would go on to have lots more problems because they had this inflammation was out of control and it was so difficult to get under control. So those first five days really watch the patient much more closely. You don't necessarily have to see them every day, but, but I'd watch them much more closely than your standard, standard cataract patients. So thank you very much. Happy to be back and uh, happy to talk about ideas or questions. Uh, thank you very much. Interesting, really, and um, review for this epidemiology. And I believe in the last 10 years that the refats gain a lot of a lot of epidemiology study. And with the advent of the new uh, investigative tools to get more and more understanding, if you had to get more and more ideas, the treatment, even though it's being changed from topical systemic steroid to more 
efficient uh, uh, targeted treatment, and this has really improved the outcome of EFIATIS patients. Uh, all the times I'm looking for the secret of EFIATIS, and the only one person that I know that having the secret is Dr. Almesfer, and all the time is hiding that secret to, to give it to me. But I'm sure that one day that he will give, <laughs> as he promised. Yani. Uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, open the floor for any questions. Thank you for a great lecture. Um, there are at least three of us in this room that are probably very excited to see an epidemiology lecture on uveitis. And uh, I know you're one of them and I'm the other one, and maybe there's a third somewhere. <laughs> but, but I thought that was great. I just actually a specific question about the, the trimethoprim sulfa for toxoplasmosis. When you said that they were less likely to have recurrences, was that compared to no antibiotics or to like no. compared to azithromycin or something else? Compared to standard triple therapy. Yeah, so he, he had a variety of different therapies depending on what was available at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, compared to the other therapies he gave, he, he, he had treated all these patients okay. with and, something. And that was one time acute treatment, not ongoing prophylaxis. That's right, like that's Collins. right. Th these, this was not with prophylaxis, which, okay. which that's actually one thing that we do know helps from Brazilian studies is that uh, giving trimethoprim sulfa three times a week can dramatically decrease the chance for someone to have recurrences. And that's something I definitely do for, you know, if there are kids, if there are people who have lesions that are adjacent to the macula, adjacent to the nerve, I talk to patients about being on prophylaxis for to toxoplasmosis. Great, thanks. Uh, it's an interesting that I have uh, some question that there is an emerging, you know, uh, viral or if into sometimes some pathogens that could lead to uveitis all over the world and every yani, couple of years we have new uh, uveitis you know, uh, pathogens that developed and looking looking for the uh, 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 Indian area this where tuberculosis getting back to the in, in the picture nowadays going to the area of Middle East like uh, Rift Valley weavers and even um, Nile virus uh, uh, you know uh, Retinitis and uh, retrochoroiditis, and uh, uh, what's about Europe and North America? Is they have that types of uh, emergent uh, types of infections, other than uh, toxo? Oh, sorry, second. Other than toxoplasmosis, do you have any new virals uh, entities that coming in the, that seen that in the last few years? Did you get any cases of uh, Rift Valley fever? Any oh, 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 oh. Oh, for, um, you know, in the Bronx, um, no. We haven't really seen the kind of the crazy newer things that people are seeing. Uh, I'm not sure why, because a lot of people come from a lot of different places there and are traveling. Um, you know, I think uh, certainly my, my, my colleagues in India, you know, have been helping to establish and understand all these things much better. Um, what's the experience here at Kekesh? Well, uh, the only problem is that we have it in the uh, Eight or ten years ago, we have the crisis of Rift Valley fevers, and we have a couple of cases that developed some um, retinitis, vasculitis, and even optic nerve inflammations. Uh, but then after that crisis, everything subsided down. Yeah. Apart from the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, that uh, tuberculosis, no, yani, an emergent infections. Yeah, I, I was, you know, I was talking to a good friend in Brazil, and she was talking about Zika virus, and that was actually, yeah. it was actually about two or three months before things blew up on the media about this because she was seeing babies with uveitic complications yeah. from Zika as well. And, and when she said, oh, have you heard about Zika? And I was completely clueless and she was telling me all about it. And the, you know, my eyes kept getting wider and wider. And then like within a month or two, two I, then it was all over the news. Yeah. Uh, this is what I mean when I'm asking, is that emergent? So. Uh, is there an explanation why older women have uh, uveitis? Yeah. And is it uh, all types or a specific type? Um, it was, it's many different kinds. Um, we weren't able to, I, so again, because of the sample size and things like that, couldn't say um, specific diagnoses. Chronic idiopathic uveitis, very common in older women. And why is it? I don't know. You know there's certainly, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis, for instance. You know, that's one, one that's more common in older women. Um, there's so much we don't understand about the immune system. Um, and, and again, because we can look at this as rates of disease, that really tells us it's real. Um, 
it was very sobering when I looked at the, when I was looking at the Kaiser data about the small number of men who were alive over the age of 65 and over 70 and so forth. Um, obviously much smaller than women, but, but we're looking at rates of disease. So that's, that's why these, I think these data really are real. The reason, we, we don't know. And I think that's, you know, we understand more about the immune system than ever we ever have. But there's still so many things we don't understand. And uh, I'm curious to try to help figure it out. I have one more question. Sir. Sure. Uh, as you have been in the States, just migrated recently, uh, all the textbook of Ephiatis, they put big chapters about, you know, CMV retinitis, especially in the mm -hmm. immunocompromise. And then, uh, uh, is it the same as we have it in the past, or now it is getting less and less in the practice? In the yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's a very interesting thing, the way the epidemiology of CMV has changed. It's changed hugely. I mean, in the 1980s, 1990s, when HIV was, at, you know, astronomically high levels in people, we didn't have heart therapy. It was a totally different disease than what we see now. The, certainly in Manhattan, in the Bronx, there's still, in the Bronx, there's a significant number of people with HIV, and that's the, bur the majority of our CMV, but actually in Manhattan, it's much more common in people who are immunosuppressed for other reasons. Um, uh, people who have, are on chemotherapy, have other sorts of underlying immuno, uh, immunosuppressive diseases. And it's very different now. Usually, instead of seeing the kind of the, the classic pizza pie of the 1980s, now it's this kind of granular change that can very slowly uh, progress. It's really important when you see these patients to really look very, very carefully at all the edges, all the way around, to make sure there's no areas of thickening because it can be a subtle change that can signify a worsening or a progression. And patients may need to have their therapy upped. Um, but it still can definitely cause all sorts of vision loss, even though it's just kind of creeping forward as it creeps forward to the nerve, creeps forward to the macula and other areas. And these, of course, you still have to worry about retinal detachments and other problems like that that can come up later. Okay, thank you very much, and really, we appreciate it. Thanks.